All right, here we go. Lesson three. Uh, you did a labbing class today uh, with the springs, and what you were looking at is Hooke's law. Now, I have no idea how far we got in class, but what you should have found is that with this spring, when you go ahead and draw a graph, and in fact, I'm going to put this on full screen. All right, when you drew a graph, if you drew a force versus uh, change in position graph, change in position of the spring as it got compressed, you would have found that as you plotted the points, you're going to get a straight line like that. This is a data point, and that is the straight line. That's for a spring. Now, um, what does this graph mean? Well, this graph has a slope. This, the slope is actually, uh, let's call it the change in force. And it has uh, the change in position here. So the change in the force over the change in position is a constant. So the change in force over the change in position equals a constant. Well, when we rearrange this, we end up with something we like to call Hooke's Law after Mr. Hook. I don't know his second name, uh, first name, but Mr. Hook, Hooke's Law says the force of a spring equals negative kx where f is the force the force uh, that you have to apply on the spring x is the amount that the spring is stretched and k is something called the sp uh, spring constant when we look over here we said k is change in force over a change in position so that means it's going to have the units of newtons per meters newtons for force meters for change in position um, but that is a number that is very specific to a spring. A bigger, thicker spring, like the springs in your car suspension, is going to have a very high value of K. A tiny little spring um, is going to have a very small value of K. So this is specific to the spring, but the slope of the force over the change in X line, that tells you what the spring constant is. Now, Hooke's law, the force of a spring equals negative, the spring constant times X. Why is it negative? Because it's basically saying when I compress a spring one way, the force is going to want to act in the other way to push it back. That's where the negative comes in. Uh, the, the change in displacement goes one way, but the force is acting in the opposite direction to push it back. So that's Hooke's Law. That's what we should have found out um, in the lab today. What I do want to do, though, is talk about spring potential energy because I don't have a spring with me. In fact, I guess now I don't. Let's leave it. I don't have a spring with me right now, but if I stretch out a spring and then let it go, then that can make an object move. That spring has a potential to do work, which is a force times a distance. So what that means is, let's talk about a compression spring, uh, like in your suspension of a car. When it's compressed, it can then do work by uh, expanding again to lift your car up. By lifting your car of a certain weight, so a certain force over a certain distance. When it's compressed, it can do work. So the question is, how much work can a spring do? Uh, how much potential energy can a compressed spring have? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, in order to think about that, we've got our graph of force times the change in position right here. We know, uh, let me write it here, work equals a force times the distance. So I need to multiply the force times the distance. We're back to the same old story which we've done before of ultimately I need to try and calculate, let's just go to here, I need to calculate the area underneath this graph if I want to find out how much potential energy this spring can have because I need to multiply the force by the distance, that is the amount of work it can do. So I need to find the area underneath. So if I find the area underneath, once again, I've got a triangle, so I'm going to call it U sub S, the potential energy of a spring. To calculate the potential energy of the spring, I need the area underneath this line, so that's going to equal, it's a triangle, so it's one half, then it's going to be base times height, so it's going to be one half the force times the change in position, X. That doesn't look too good, but we can do something else to it, because here's the funny thing. The force of the spring here is described by this equation right here. 
we're going to uh, get rid of the negative, but the force of this spring is described by this equation here. It varies over time. It varies as part of this, uh, as you stretch it, which is why it's um, a triangle shape in the first place. So I'm just going to take this, plug it into here, and we know the potential energy of a spring equals one half. Then I'm going to go k x times another x which is unnecessary, I can just say x squared, that'll make life easier, and that is the potential energy a spring has. Okay, let me pause it right there.